Hey guys, so today we're going to be taking a look at some of the specific ways that America started to get involved in world affairs um, and some of the different places that were acquired by America during this imperialist time period. Um, so we're going to start by looking at how America acquired what would go on to become our 49th and 50th states, Alaska and Hawaii. So let's start where it's nice and cold in Alaska. Uh, so America actually acquired Alaska uh, r just after the Civil War, and there's a couple things I want to point out on the map down here about Alaska. Um, so first of all, you will notice that it is not next to Hawaii. It is in the northern part of the United States next to Canada, unlike what most maps show it as. Um, you will also notice that it is big. Look at the state of Ho Alaska here, guys. Like, it is about a third of the size of the continental United States. It is huge, huge. We don't often realize that. Um, I also want you to look how close it is to Russia, right? Uh, this is where we imagine that a lot of the Native Americans back in the ancient times probably crossed into Europe or from Europe into America. Um, you might have heard it called like the Bering Strait. This is the Bering Sea right here. Um, so this is a huge, huge part of the world um, that, or this, uh, its relationship with Al Russia um, is a huge part of Alaskan history because actually it was owned by Russia before it was purchased by the United States. So in 1867, the Secretary of State negotiated a deal in order to buy this territory from Russia. And he paid about $7.2 million for this, okay? So $7.2 million is approximately two cents an acre. If you know anything about purchasing land, even in 1867, that was a fabulous deal, right? Like that's a lot of land to be buying um, for just $7.2 million. That's actually per acreage less than what we played, paid for the Louisiana Territory. And the Louisiana ter Territory is less than a third of that size. Um, so this is a really good deal. So you would think like Americans would be super excited, right? Like, oh, look at this great deal. Our Secretary of State um, issued, like we've got this new amazing territory. Well, you'd be wrong if you thought that, right? Think about Alaska, it's 1867, right? Basically what people in the United States were like, dude, are you an idiot, right? Like, you just paid $7 million for ice and snow and caribou. Like, come on, dude, what were you thinking? We just fought a war, we don't have any money, and you bought an iceberg? Like, hello, a glacier! People thought this was ridiculously stupid. In fact, it was nicknamed Seward's Folly, and it pretty much ruined William Seward's career. Um, a folly, if you think about that, that's like a foolish decision. And so basically, everybody in the United States was like, this is stupid. I cannot believe you paid this much money for like a glacier, okay? Um, and it actually, like I said, it pretty much ruined this guy's career. It was not until the 1900s that we're going to realize how important Alaska really was. Um, because Alaska is rich in a lot of things. It's rich in timber, so wood. It's rich in minerals, like gold. There's a huge, um, there was actually an Alaskan gold rush. We don't often talk about that. Um, you might hear like the Klondike, that's that area. It's also rich in oil. This is one of the major spots in the United States where we get our own oil. So that's a really big deal. Um, unfortunately, William Seward would not live to see uh, his deal pan out and he basically died in disgrace uh, for this uh, purchase. But the thing to remember about Alaska is really, other than like a lot of local Native American groups, there are not a whole lot of people living in Alaska before we get there, um, before we purchase it. So that's going to be something that we really settle um, and kind of have to learn to live with a lot of the Native Inuit tribes that are in that area. So let's now move out of this particularly cold weather and move into Hawaii. Yes! This is a lot more my style. So this quote here is a quote from William McKinley, who was president um, at this time period. And he says that uh, in a speech where he is trying to talk about why Hawaii is important, he says, we need Hawaii just as much and a good deal more than we did California. It is manifest destiny. So remember, manifest destiny is this idea that this is something that belongs to us, that we deserve this um, because of our democracy and the fact that God likes us best. And um, if you look at this campaign poster, I always think this is really interesting. So 
he says, prosperity at home, prestige abroad. So that's kind of how William McKinley ran as president. He was going to be the candidate of prestige, right? So this is kind of where we are picking up with um, William McKinley here. Uh, so when we first got to Hawaii, it was actually in the 1820s. So a guy named Captain Cook, who was a British guy, um, discovered Hawaii uh, in the early 1800s when he landed there. And not long after he did that, missionaries are being sent um, and Christian schools are being founded throughout the nation of Hawaii. Um, this is going to be kind of the first interaction that we have um, as white people with the Hawaiian people. Um, this is our first contact. Right? And it inspires a lot of interest. Like, think about it. This is a tropical island. Um, it's a very nice place. I've been to Hawaii. It's beautiful. Uh, and the Hawaiian people are very interesting, and they want to kind of know more about it. They want to see if they can develop it a little bit more. So it inspires a lot of interest in Hawaii. And then by the 1850s, it's more than just missionaries and Christians who are moving to Hawaii. Um, it is going to become an industry of sugar plantations. So sugar is a really important crop. Um, it has been for a lot of American history. And so a lot of American businessmen are going to move to Hawaii uh, in order to start some sugar plantations there. And it's going to be kind of come the basis for the Hawaiian economy. Um, and they bring in, as they are coming in, they bring in a lot of contract laborers. A lot of the native Hawaiians are not really interested in being involved in the sugar plantation. Can't say I blame them too much. Um, so they kind of bring in other people with them in order to kind of grow these businesses a little bit more. However, what's going to end up happening is the number of Americans in Hawaii is going to start outnumbering the native Hawaiians in the area, right? Now remember, at this point, Hawaii is a sovereign kingdom. They have their own, like, royal family. They do their own thing, right? They're not controlled by anyone else. However, American businessmen are increasing the population of Hawaii by bringing in these contract laborers, so there are going to be more Americans in Hawaii than there are native Hawaiians, and that's going to play a really big role. Um, so in 1875, a treaty is signed that removes the tariffs on goods between Hawaii and America. So remember, um, a tariff is a tax on an imported good, right? So there had been taxes on Hawaiian goods, like sugar. However, remember, most of these goods are owned by American, most of these plantations are owned by American businessmen. So by removing that tariff, it's going to make Hawaiian sugar pretty cheap. Um, so sugar growing in Hawaii becomes much more profitable business. And the American plantation owners and growers there start to expand those businesses, all right? In 1887, Pearl Harbor is acquired. Um, so think about when we were talking about Alfred T. Mahan, one of the things he said is that in order to grow your navy, you need to have coaling stations all around the world in order to refuel your ships. So we make a deal with the Hawaiian government in order to acquire Pearl Harbor as a place where the American Navy can come in and be in the Pacific. Like, think about where Hawaii is. It's almost exactly the midway between North America and Asia and Indonesia, right? So it's a really good stopping point um, in the Pacific for us. And so the Navy becomes very, very dependent on Hawaii because it's basically the only place that they can stop. If the Navy is going to the Philippines or going to Japan or Russia or anywhere in Asia or China, um, they have to stop in Hawaii, right? So that becomes a really important part of the American Navy, all right? So we're already seeing American business being huge in Hawaii, and now we're seeing the American military being very dependent on Hawaii, right? So Americans are gaining a lot of interest here. Um, in 1887, the king, who you see here on the left, is uh, named Kaluakaya, and he is forced to change the Constitution. And basically there's pressure by the American businessmen, and what they want to do is say, we want to add wealth and property requirements to the right to vote in the Hawaiian government. Uh, so this is like voting for like the legislative branch in Hawaii. Uh, so by adding property rights, okay, so saying you have to own a certain amount of property or you have to have a certain amount of wealth in order to be able to vote, who in Hawaii has the most property? Who in Hawaii has the most wealth? Well, it's the American businessmen, right? So what this is actually going to do is strip a lot of the native Hawaiians of that right of suffrage, that voting right. And it's going to give a lot more power to the wealthy Americans that are living in Hawaii. And again, remember, I cannot stress this enough, Hawaii is still an independent nation. They have a king, right? So what we're seeing is that native Hawaiians are losing power in their own government 
right? In 1890, um, the McKinley Tariff removes the duty-free status of Hawaiian sugar, so it basically set, puts the tariff back on, and American business growers in Hawaii are furious, right? Because what does adding a tariff do? It makes that sugar more expensive, and it means that the American businessmen are actually getting um, less money for their sugar now, and it's harder for them to sell their products. And this is really going to be the tipping point for a lot of the American businessmen in Hawaii. Um, so we're going to see what happens with this here uh, after this tariff goes on it. So in 1891, King Kaluakaia dies. And his sister, a woman named Queen Lile Lukolani, um, who is, like I said, his sister, she gains power. And she is very much against a lot of the American business that's been going on in Hawaii. And she insists on what she calls Hawaii for the Hawaiians, right? So she tries to get the property qualification taken away. Um, she tries to basically try to enfranchise more Hawaiians. Um, you can see Queen Lile Lukolani and on this picture on the right here. Um, this is the Iolani Palace, which is where the royal family lives. I actually got to visit there. That's a photograph that I took of Hawaii, in Hawaii when I was there. Um, but think about how this is gonna affect her. Okay, it's 1891. What is the status of women in America? Well, they're not equal to men, right? So now we have a woman who is the queen, but she is telling these American businessmen that what they're doing is not right. How popular do you think she's gonna be with these guys? She's not going to get very popular, right? So the Americans in Hawaii are afraid that they're going to lose power because of this. So they start to say the United States should annex or take the state of, or take Hawaii as a um, territory of the United States. So they start to propose annexation. So think about what they're doing here. They're basically saying that, well, there are more Americans here, right? This is exactly what they did with Texas. Um, there are more Americans here than there are Hawaiians, so why shouldn't it be part of America? Uh, this is going to require, though, the agreement of the Queen of Hawaii, right? This would be as if we today went over to Great Britain and we're like, hey, Queen Liz, would it be okay if we, like, annexed Great Britain, right? The Queen's not going to let us do that. And this is a nation with a queen that we're trying to take away her power to make it a territory of the United States. Queen Lulea Lukolani is not going to let that happen. So in, in January of 1893, the USS Boston, so this is a ship, drops Marines and businessmen who basically overthrow the government. They take the queen and they put her under house arrest in her own home, in her own palace. She's not allowed to leave a certain number of rooms. Like she's given like these few rooms. She and her ladies are forced to be locked up there. And a new government is created, headed by a man named Sanford Dole, um, who was kind of one of the chief growers in Hawaii. Um, he's got a pretty righteous beard, not a very nice guy. And he is trying to push this annexation. If you know the name Dole, you might be familiar of it with like the Dole pineapple, right? These, if you go to the grocery store today, Dole is still a company. It is still in Hawaii. There is still a plantation for pineapple and other fruits that they grow there. Um, this is still a major business here. And this was founded by a guy who overthrew the Queen of Hawaii, right? Um, these are some petitions, just some pictures of uh, against annexation by local men's and women's groups. Uh, so you can really see that the local people of Hawaii were not interested in being annexed. They did not want that. They wanted to maintain their sovereignty. They wanted to keep their government. Uh, however, they were pretty much overlooked. And in 1897, McKinley, as president, and remember, what did he say? We need Hawaii more than we did California. It's manifest destiny. Um, he becomes president, annexes, or, or advocates annexation to the Congress, and eventually, by 1897, Hawaii is annexed and becomes a U.S. territory. So think about what we did here, guys, right? We went in to a native country with a sovereign government, with a queen, with a king, and business leaders, businessmen, overthrew the government so that they could get their sugar to the United States for cheap. Because as part of the US territory, it would remove that tariff, right? So there's still a lot of debate and issue today, um, which we're going to get into more in class, over whether Hawaii, like, whether this is historically something that we should honor, um, whether this is something that's a good thing. 
for America. So this is a really big deal and something that I really want you to take seriously when we think about Hawaii uh, as part of the United States. Um, so next, we are going to take a look at our involvement in the Spanish-American War. All right. So this war is nicknamed um, by Theodore Roosevelt, as no less, uh, as the Splendid Little War. Okay. It's a very short little war as far as wars go. Um, it's only it's less than a year long, uh, and it takes place obviously um, between Spain and America, uh, and it is over a couple different islands, but specifically it is over Cuba. So let me give you just a little bit of background on what was going on uh, in this particular conflict. Uh, so we're going to kind of see how we got involved in the Spanish-American War. We want you to think about how valid these causes were. Uh, we'll go more in depth into this in class. Uh, the individuals who gained fame through this, um, what we got through our involvement in the war and what we lost. Okay, So that's what we're going to focus on today. Um, so we're going to start by actually talking about a revolution. So Cuba is controlled by Spain. It is a Spanish colony. It has been for a long time. Uh, and a lot of people in Cuba are not happy with Spanish rule, particularly a guy named Jose Martí. So Jose Martí um, leads a revolution in 1895 against Spanish rule, um, and it's a relatively short revolution, um, but it's not a relatively pretty one. The uh, people of Cuba, the native Cubans, they're fighting a guerrilla warfare, um, so they are basically, you know, it's kind of deal like burning homes and property and this sort of thing. Uh, but what you need to understand is that, much like Hawaii, there were American businessmen in Cuba. We own sugar plantations as well in Cuba. Uh, so a lot of the property that is being destroyed by the, uh, rep the rebels is American property. Okay, So think about how Americans are going to feel about that. Um, another thing that happens in this conflict is something called reconcentration camps. So think about what that word might sound familiar to you as. Think about like World War II with concentration camps. It's basically the same idea where the Spanish, in order to kind of control the Cuban population, would round up a lot of the um, native Cubans, and they were put into these camps, and they were given very little food and water. They were all kind of smushed in together. Um, disease was pretty rampant. Uh, there was a lot of starvation. They were super terrible conditions. Uh, and this was basically very similar to what the Nazis were doing in World War II. Uh, and this word kind of got out, right? Like people um, saw photographs and stories of these concentration camps. And they're like, whoa, civil rights issue, right? And a lot of people really got on Spain for this. Um, so there are two camps in America. Um, there are the American businessmen and there are the average Americans who are hearing about the stories of this revolution. The American businessmen are opposed to the revolution. As you can imagine, it's threatening their income, their property is being destroyed, um, they're losing crop, right? They're going to lose money. However, a lot of other Americans are supporting the revolution. Um, they kind of see it as the, following the same ideals as the American Revolution, overthrowing a tyrannical government. They hear stories about the concentration camps and they don't want um, things like this to continue, right? So you've got two basic groups of people in the United States when this revolution is going on. Um, so this is kind of one of the first causes, really. Um, this is the background for where we're going to get involved in the Spanish-American War. It's also important to understand that there are a lot of reporters um, that come from America to Cuba in order to report on this revolution and what's going on, and that's how a lot of that is getting back to the states. Um, so the next slide has just got a couple photographs here. Um, so this photograph down at the bottom are some Cuban men in one of the reconcentration camps. And you can see, I mean, when we're talking about horrible conditions, we mean horrible conditions. Um, the picture up there at the top is a lot of the skeletons of people who died in these reconcentration camps. And just look at the pile of these bones, guys. Like, huge numbers of people died. Um, and this is really something that's going to anger a lot of the Americans uh, at this time. So um, this political cartoon, I think, is pretty interesting. If you look at um, the political cartoon, it's trying to encourage Americans to get involved in this conflict. So if you look down at the left, this represents Cuba. And you can see that Cuba has been chained up by Spain. Um, it says the 16th century methods. So you think about like the Inquisition and medieval torture, basically, um, is what they're accusing the Spanish of. You can see at the top, it says the Spain's motto, words like barbarity, cruelty, murder. Um, and Who's reaching out trying to save Cuba? 
liberty, right? So the idea is that the Cuban Revolution is about liberty. Um, but look who else is so close, right? Cuba and America are this close. They're only 90 miles from each other. But what's Uncle Sam doing? He's blinded, right? And what's he blind, blinded by? American business interest. Um, so this political cartoon is really showing you that um, businessmen are holding America back while liberty is what's trying to liberate Cuba, right? And so, again, trying to get Americans involved in this conflict here. Um, so while this is going on, okay, um, like I said, there are a group of journalists down in uh, Cuba. And as, there, as the revolution is kind of winding down, right, there's a lot of reports coming back and it's like, oh, you know, things are kind of good now. Like, you know, it's, it's pretty chill. It's pretty good. Um, but that's not going to sell newspapers, right? So this is something called yellow journalism. Um, and just a really famous quote, it may be apocryphal, which means this guy may have never said this, but um, William Randolph Hearst was the um, owner of a major newspaper in New York City. And supposedly when he got a telegram saying that, you know, things have calmed down now, things are pretty chill in Cuba, uh, he replies, I'll tell you what. You just furnish the pictures and I'll provide the war. In other words, saying like, if you can give me a photograph, I can make up a story that goes back with that photograph. And this is called yellow journalism. And it's called this because it was based on a cartoon um, where the main character of the cartoon was named the Yellow Kid. So William Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer, two of the major leaders um, of the New York Journal and the New York World, the two biggest newspapers in New York City. And basically they're going back and forth at each other, trying to sell newspapers. And whoever can come up with the best headlines and sell the best story is going to sell the most newspapers. So they use something known as sensationalism. So basically this is an idea that uh, emphasizes sensationalism over fact. So it emphasizes um, small details that you exaggerate. Sensationalism is an exaggeration, right? So it's this idea that we want to sell newspapers, so if we have to lie, if we have to make up stuff, if we have to you know, manipulate the story in any way that we can, that's what we're going to do. And if you really think about it, a lot of news um, stations do this today. This is not old, right? This is new. Um, this is, I mean, this is not something that's gone away. It's something that's still here. Uh, so this is a really like sensational idea, especially because most Americans are only getting their news from this source. They don't have any other sources to check it out. So they have to rely on the newspapers and hope what is being reported is fact. Um, so like I mentioned, these are the two guys I mentioned earlier, Hertz and Pulitzer. Um, both own these two major newspaper companies, um, the New York Journal and the New York World, and it's all about trying to sell the most newspapers. If you think about it, if you've ever seen the movie Newsies, um, there's a clip in that movie where the kids are basically saying, you know, make up a story, because that's how you're going to sell the papers. So, like, saying that there's a, like, extra, extra flood in New York City, when really there was just, like, a little leak at somebody's house, right? That's yellow journalism, and that's what these guys are trying to do. Um, and so they're basically trying to make America get involved in what's going on in Cuba. Okay, um, so yellow journalism is the first back, uh, cause that we have here. Um, this is just a great example of American yellow journalism. Um, so read the headline, it says, Spaniards search women on American steamers. That's an American ship. Um, so you've got this woman, and what have they done? They have stripped her naked. <gasps> shocking right so they're not just searching women they're stripping them down and like you know feeling them up and oh my god can you imagine right like how terrible for these women um, and if you'll notice this is not a photograph right this is a drawing maybe these guys are not actually stripping down American women maybe they're just like looking through their luggage right um, but this is the sensationalism Right? And imagine if you were a woman in 1895 and you saw this in the paper, you would be shocked. Like, how dare they, right? You might think that, what if they tried to do this to me? I can't even imagine. And so this is that idea. They're trying to get Americans more involved. Um, the next thing that happens is a letter um, called the DeLome letter. So the DeLome letter was written by a guy named Enrique Dupe de DeLome. Um, he was the Spanish minister to the United States. And he writes this letter that's critical of William McKinley. Remember, McKinley's president. And here's the thing about this letter, right? He basically criticizes McKinley's job as president, what he's doing. Now, it's okay for Americans to criticize their president, but it is not okay 
for foreign governments to criticize the president, right? Like, you can say all the trash you want about William McKinley as an American, but as soon as somebody from Spain does it, well, oh, no, 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 like, I don't think so. You can't say that about my president, right? Um, so this letter is leaked to the press, and the press have a field day with this, right? Like, can you believe this guy is supposed to represent Spain in the United States? And what is he saying? He's talking about how terrible McKinley is. Are we going to let this stand, right? So this is where a lot of the jingoists come in. So remember, jingoism is people who um, are trying to fight for American imperialism. And a lot of the people that read this letter wanted to get back at Spain because they were like, we cannot put up with this crap. Um, so this is an excerpt from the letter, and you can see it's in this third paragraph down here, oops, um, where it says, besides the natural and inevitable coarseness with which he repeats all that the press and the public opinion of Spain has said of Wheeler, it shows once more what McKinley is, weak and catering to the rabble, and besides, a low politician who desires to leave a door open to me and to stand well with the jingos of his party, right? <gasps> Catering to the rabble. Well, that's the American people. He's like he's insulting us too, and he's a low politician. He's weak. You can't say this about our president. So it really increases the fervor of the jingos in America. To remember the jingos or jingoism, right? Um, the last major cause that we have here of the Spanish-American War is the explosion of the USS Maine. So the USS Maine was a ship um, that had been sent to Cuba during the revolution to protect the American interests there. So protect the businesses, the property owned by Americans, protect any Americans that might be there. Um, basically, it's just kind of the Navy floating off the coast to say like, hey, we got your back, right? Well, wouldn't you know, an explosion happens. The ship sinks, 250 sailors are killed on this ship, and it is a major tragedy. When the papers get a hold of this, they are blaming Spain. They basically say Spanish spies boarded the main and set explosives. Now imagine, think about like September 11th, right? Just after September 11th, 11th happened and we found out who had done it, all of America was wanting to get at them, right? This is the same kind of thing because the Americans were told, the American population was told that Spain had blown up not just American citizens, American Navy men, right? People in the military. This was a huge catastrophe and Americans were furious, right? They wanted to get at Spain. And this is gonna be the deciding factor that allows Americans to declare war on Spain. Um, what's interesting to find is that research over the years have been done to prove that it was not Spain, that it, blew up the main. It was probably like some misfiring on the ship in the engine room or something. Terrible tragedy, a terrible accident, but definitely not Spain. So these are the three major causes of this war. Yellow journalism, so the press basically telling Americans what they want to hear. A letter written by a guy who said, our president is weak. And the explosion of a ship blamed on a country who didn't actually have any involvement in it. Not terribly great reasons to get involved in a war, right? However, that's exactly what happens. Um, so we actually fight this war on two different fronts. Um, the first front that we fight it on is the Philippines. So the Philippines are I a series of islands that are owned by Spain, okay? They're like in Indonesia, so just south of Japan. Um, and there was actually a revolt in the Philippines as well. Um, they had revolted against Spain, and a guy named Emilio Agu Aguinaldo um, was the leader of that revolt. And the United States kind of wanted to edge its way into the Philippines at that point. Um, we kind of saw that the Philippines would be a really another great stopping point for us. Um, so the Pacific Fleet heads to the Philippines in case a war happens, right? So in case we declare war on Spain, which all this stuff had kind of been building up to, we want to have some people there just in case. So we can fight the Spanish on that front as well. Um, they were led by a guy named Commodore George Dewey, um, and he fights a pretty major battle in which he destroys the fin Spanish fleet at Manila Bay. And this is gonna be where the first surrender of the war takes place, where the Spanish troops surrender to the Americans, not the Filipinos. Remember, this began as a revolt in the Philippines, but they're not surrendering to the Filipino men, right? They're surrendering to the American troops. Um, it's going to be part of the American Treaty, okay? 
kind of keep that in mind because the result of that is going to be pretty important. Um, the other part of the war is the war in the Caribbean. So this is the war in Cuba, right? So the American fleet, basically their job is to blockade Havana. Havana is the capital of Cuba, um, and if we can blockade them, it keeps troops from or keeps troops and supplies from getting in and out and allows us to basically take more control over the island. Um, now, one particular man uh, really kind of became famous in this war, and that man is Theodore Roosevelt. So Theodore Roosevelt at the beginning of the war was William McKinley's Secretary of the Navy, Assistant Secretary of the Navy, not even the top secretary. But when this war broke out, he decided that he wanted to join up and fight in the war. So he resigned his post and joins a, um, or forms a unit of cavalry known as the Rough Riders. Um, so these are a group of men who are going to fight under Theodore Roosevelt. Um, they are particularly famous for their charge at San Juan Hill. Um, so basically, there are a couple different victories here, and we're going to look more in depth at these in class. Um, first at Kettle Hill which sets up the victory at San Juan Hill. Um, so these are just two major strategic points that we are taking um, as part of this war here. And Theodore Roosevelt really got his name um, for his role in both of these. Uh, ironically, didn't play as big of a role as he's made out to be, but because he goes on to become president, it really is kind of talked up a little bit more. Um, however, Really what becomes important in this war is the Navy. We could not have won this war without the Navy. Um, the naval battle along the Cuban coast destroys the Spanish fleet, um, and that is really going to be what kind of bites the bullet for Spain. Um, so the Navy, both in the Philippines and in the Caribbean, um, are going to cause this war to end relatively quickly. Like I said, the war is less than a year long. Um, that's where it gets its nickname, the Splendid Little War, right? It's kind of romanticized in American culture at the time, and people just kind of like think of it fondly, um, but this is going to be the end of the war. Uh, so the treaty is an interesting treaty. First of all, I love this newspaper um, article that says, the peace treaty signed at last, the Spanish are very gloomy, right? This idea, like, oh, poor Spain. Um, but we have a couple amendments that come out of this. Um, so Cuba uh, gains its independence from Spain from Spain, but not its independence from us. We had passed an amendment earlier in the war um, that granted Cuba what was called protectorate status. This was called the Teller Amendment. You might actually want to write this down. The Teller Amendment, which we had passed early, forbade us from taking Cuba as a colony. We had basically promised the Cubans that we're not going to do that, right? So at the end of the war, we can't take Cuba as a colony but we can protect them. So the protectorate status basically implies that we're gonna keep you safe, we're gonna overlook your government, you get your own government, but we're gonna make sure you do everything right, and you know, we can still kind of have our own interests there, so we can still have our businessmen there and that sort of thing, but we're gonna protect you. Really, when you think about it, it's, it's a colony, right? It's basically a colony. Um, next, we have Puerto Rico and Guam also two Caribbean islands that were controlled by Spain. Um, both of these are given to us as colonies, as U.S. territories. And we don't use the term colony in America. That's kind of a dirty word in America. So we don't call them colonies, we call them territories. Um, but we, we both take those territories as um, away from Spain and now make them part of the U.S. Uh, and finally we have the Philippines. So we actually buy the Philippines from Spain. Um, we offer Spain $20 million in order to take control of the Philippines, uh, and that's going to become, like I said, a good naval um, station, kind of similar to Pearl Harbor was in Hawaii. Uh, so this is the war. This wraps it up. Um, so when you think about kind of what you saw in this war, um, it's a really short, really quick little conflict. But it really is America starting to get involved in the major world stage. Um, that's really what the significance of this is. Uh, so anyway, we'll talk more specifically about some of these things in class and what um, really was, was this a valid conflict and that sort of thing. Um, but until then, I will see you next time. Goodbye.